Hi, my name is Jacob Neubauer, and I developed this lesson plan along with Julia Sweeney. We are both third grade teachers at Maureen Joy Charter School in Durham. And this year we had the privilege of working together in a co-teaching model, a fully inclusive model, where we were able to cluster all of the students with IEPs into one room where Julia was able to serve as the full-time push-in parallel co-teaching um, model as the special ed teacher of record where I was the general ed teacher of record. It's important to incorporate the arts and integrate the arts across grade levels, across subject areas, across diverse student populations. And the reason Julie and I think this in our classroom uh, is especially because we have many students with IEPs and many students who are ELL, so they might have um, barriers in expressing themselves and expressing their mathematical concepts. Um, integrating the arts also removes the situational bias that math just belongs in school and art just belongs at the museum. When students can recognize that both math and the arts are ways of relating to the world around them and they start to see how the interconnectedness of the parts they see all around them combine to make a larger whole. After examining Piet Mondrian's artwork, students are gonna have a chance to make their own drafts of their own pieces that are inspired by Piet Mondrian's pieces. Then they're later going to be able to work with their peers in their classroom to create a collaborative piece where four to five students or six can create one poster incorporating all of their own equivalent fractions and their own color schemes into that poster to make one collaborative piece. This lesson plan is going to explore equivalent fractions and the conceptual understanding behind equivalent fractions using Piet Mondrian's pieces of art. Students aren't going to just realize one half equals six twelfths. They're going to understand what does it mean for something to be one half what does it mean for something to be six twelfths? And why are those the same thing, even though we use different numbers to express those fractions? The emphasis of this lesson plan is on the relationship between parts and wholes. Students are gonna get a deep, under, deep understanding of that relationship and how that can help us generate equivalent fractions. Your scholars might be like our scholars, and they might not quite understand why this three by two array, in this case, is going to be a different fraction than the three by two array over here. Now, this is showing that they might be leaning on some procedural understanding if they're trying to go about solving or representing the parts in a procedural way using what they know already about fractions and representing them. But we really are pushing for a deep conceptual understanding of equivalent fractions here. So we have to really push students to think about the parts and the whole. So if scholars come up and they really are not understanding why in some cases this is one half and in some cases this is six six. You can push them to the question of what is the part and what is the whole. In this case, you can say color in or shade in your part that you're talking about. Okay. So they'll shade in this one part. And you can say, well, how many total parts are there? And they can say, well, there's one part, two, and three. But you know, two and three, they aren't equal to this one part. But if I combine them, if I combine them, then I can make two equal parts. So you, first question you're asking, what is the part you're talking about? The second question you're asking is, 
what is the whole or what are the total number of parts? And then the final follow-up question that you don't even need to emphasize, but if you do want to emphasize how to represent or how to note how to notate with fractions, you can say the number of total parts goes on the bottom. That's two, because there's one, two parts. The part that we're talking about, or the part that's shaded in yellow, is the number that goes on top. I'm going to write that in, in black so that you can see it. You might want to just, you know, use some colors to so that they can have that connection between the various parts of your notation and the model that represented. So now let's go do this same one. Remember the first question we're asking is what part are we talking about? And the second question we're asking is how many total parts are there? And the third question is that's optional that you can post to your students is how would you represent that using a fraction? So how many parts are there here? The first question here is what part are we talking about? So let's say we're going to talk about this one square. We're talking about this one square up here in the corner. How many total parts are there? Well, there's one I just saw, two, three, four, five, and six. So if you want to push your scholars to answering the next question of how you would represent that with a fraction, you can say, how many total parts are we talking about? Or how many parts are we talking about? One part. How many total parts are there? Six. So this square right here is talking about one sixth. Now, this isn't part of equivalent fractions. This half is not equivalent to this because fractions represent relationships between parts and wholes, but students might get tripped up when they're looking at how much space, um, how much space this part takes up and how much space this whole takes up. So you really, really have to change up the scenarios and relationships each time so that they can develop a strong conceptual understanding of equivalent fractions and what they mean rather than a procedural understanding of fractions and equivalent fractions so that they can just plug and chug. That would, that would not be the ideal here. The materials you'll need for this lesson plan are the worksheet provided, some coloring utensils, some large chart paper, preferably some large chart graph paper if your school has that, and some different spaces where your kids will be able to work in collaborative groups on their final piece together. This is a little behind the scenes action. It's really great if you have large chart paper like this that is actually has graph lines on it. So the kids can use that when they are creating their own squares and their own parts um, for their Mondrian, Mondrian collaborative pieces. So we're gonna zoom in a little bit so that you can see um, what the kids are going to be able to do. For the final collaborative piece for this Mondrian inspired art project, we recommend students working in groups of three to five. First, the kids are going to compare their different rough drafts they did on their own worksheet, and they're going to decide what part of each person's rough draft they want to include on their large larger collaborative piece. So you can see here um, that they are, there's not a really right or wrong way to do it. This is a time where they just interacted with a lot of the mathematical concepts and now they are able to more focus on um, drawing their pieces neatly, choosing their color palette. And again, um, for choosing the color palette, there's not really a right or wrong way to do it. Um, this is something if you've established a conversational culture in your classroom uh, where students are used to collaborating and used to sharing their ideas, um, they can simply decide what color palette they want to work on. Maybe each student can pick a color or maybe they can um, 
all agree on a certain set of colors together. That's really up to them. And then they just get to explore um, drawing the different parts as, as it fits into the larger whole or the closed figure of the piece. Um, now normally I would push them to make sure that there's no white spaces around the edge, but I didn't want to take up a ton of time on the video um, with y'all watching me fill in all the outer edges of all the white space. So yeah, when the students will know they're done when they have completed or filled in or um, the amount of space that they want to take up for their piece. For this one, it's going to be taking up a six by five area. Um, and Mondrian's pieces uh, had a lot of, they usually were rectangles or squares. So we don't really need to have any tails on the end or um, any leftover pieces like that, that, that wouldn't fit into a closed shape. But you know, then again, if, if, if the students decide that's the artistic direction they wanna go and they have like a reason why, or maybe not even a reason, but a strong desire as to why they wanna do it that way, then that's really their call.